Hey, folks, special announcement. October 1st was International Coffee Day. Did you know that? Well, you have one more day to celebrate with Sunset Lake Sebe Day. They are celebrating with a sale on their best-selling Farmer's Roast Sebe Day coffee. Today, and today only, when you use the code COFFEE, of all things, mm. You'll save 30% on all one-time purchases of their delicious dark roast whole bean coffee. And then, of course, you can use code uh, left is best for 20% off of everything else. But if you've never tried this Seba Day coffee from Sunset Lake, I am telling you, it is, it's my weekend brew. It really is fantastic. I mean, it's a great coffee on its own. But uh, with the Seba Day, it really is uh, it's cool. Uh, Sunset Lake Sebade is a majority employee-owned farm that ships handcrafted hemp and Sebade products directly to your door. See their website for more for sale terms and conditions. SunsetLakeSebade.com. Coupon code COFFEE. Today only, Monday, October 2nd. And speaking of which, now's the show. the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. Uh, and I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Monday, October 2nd, 2023. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Ian Milheiser, senior correspondent at Vox, to give us a preview of this crap show we're going to see in the Supreme Court over the next year. And then at 1 p.m., special appearance. Um, second guest, Mark Bankston, litigator at Farrar and Ball Law Firm. This is the firm that represented some of the Sandy Hook parents in the Texas case. We'll be here on a major lawsuit being brought against elon musk for falsely accusing a man of being part of a neo-nazi brawl on what was then called twitter also on the program today government shutdown gets a 45 day reprieve but will kevin mccarthy because matt gates is determined to make him gone and the real question is what will the democrats do Meanwhile, Clarence Thomas recuses himself on an election denier's appeal, but won't on this major Consumer Financial Protection Bureau case. Gavin Newsom picks former SEIU official and former Uber and Airbnb lobbyist and Emily's List head. And potentially Maryland resident? And oddly non-Californian in some technical fashion, uh, Lafona Butler uh, to be Diane Feinstein's replacement. 
Also, uh, Newsom makes some news by vetoing. It means the bill had passed both houses in California, a bill to provide unemployment benefits to striking workers after two weeks on the picket lines. Awful. That one, uh, people aren't going to forget. Meanwhile, Trump in court today for fraud, and it, I almost fell off my chair right before the show, and I'll tell you why. UAW expands its strike against Ford and GM last Friday. Meanwhile, reaches a deal with Mack Truck. And 75,000 Kaiser Permanente healthcare workers are getting ready for a three-day national strike that would start on Wednesday. The Minnesota Twin City Marathon canceled because of extreme heat in Minnesota. And lastly, a Nobel Prize awarded to the mRNA developers. Mm. Can you believe the size of this conspiracy? For Dystopia Award? All this and more on today's Majority Report. Let me also just add, uh, rest in peace, Tim Wegfield, the uh, third winningest pitcher in the history of the Red Sox. Was on the team for like twenty years mm -hmm. during like the in the t more or less the twenty years run up. Well, not twenty year run up. I guess he was on for like maybe ten years or eight years before uh, breaking the uh, curse. And uh, uh, it's, it's a sad story, but also um, you know, a uh, big part of life well lived. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yep. Yeah. Great knuckleball pitcher. A great, I saw yeah, some was, of those. That's all, that's all he was. Yeah. yeah, I saw some of those in uh, pitches in slow motion were going around social media yesterday, and it was <laughs> the way it floated off the ground like that it's was nuts. pretty unreal. And the thing is, it was always frustrating watching him on some level, even though he won so many games because there'd be so many home runs, mm -hmm. so many walks. Right. It was like it was it was as frustrating as you get as a batter, you would almost get as a viewer. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Um, uh, rest in peace, uh, Tim Wakefield. All right, so I just cracked up uh, before the thing because it turns out that Donald Trump has just found out. He's in court right now for his fraud case. And he has just found out in the proceedings that he will not be having a jury trial because his legal team forgot to check off the box requesting for one in this case. And that that so, can't be right. It, 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 it's true. <laughs> and the, so wait, the judge said nobody asked for a jury trial, and that's why the judge is just going to be presiding over it. Oh, that's amazing. So, uh, well, <laughs> this happened to me a lot in college. I like was behind on deadlines, needed to do administrative paperwork, and just oh, I forgot it. I, I remember yeah. one time that happened to me in high school. There was another page on the back of my exam, and I just didn't turn it over. And I would have aced that exam. I mean, it, it could happens happen to anybody. To, happens to everybody. But well, so now that's that's going to be his one of his top defenses thrown out because like you can't trust the New York City jury, right? Because there's a lot of non-white people on that one. I mean, there. Uh, God knows what like just. To, to gear up for a jury trial and then find out it's not a jury trial, it seems to be to be <laughs> going to be not like, ideal. Uh, not ideal for your defense. Uh, we, we, it's all Scratch going to, that. don't worry, uh, it's all going according to plan. Um, but that's amazing. Uh, I will, maybe we'll ask um, uh, Mark Bankston what the implications of something like that would be. It's not exactly uh, uh, in his portfolio. You got to zig when they think you're going to zag. Exactly. Uh, meanwhile, um, Right now, the um, Washington is basically just waiting to find out if Matt Gates will bring up his motion, and it seems like undoubtedly he will, uh, to vacate and, and what the Democrats will do. Because the Democrats are going to be needed in significant numbers to vote to keep, um, to keep uh, Kevin McCarthy chair. And, and we will talk more about this later in the program as to like what the pros and cons would be for Democrats uh, to do so. But my understanding is no one in the, the squad is prepared to vote for McCarthy to be uh, chair. And even some blue dogs are like, unless we get anything, who knows, though. But here is uh, AOC on, um, uh, on Jake Tapper's show. To be clear, what happened was the Senate passed a continuing resolution for 45 days 
that had just about everything uh, that they wanted except for Ukraine aid. It went over to the House. It passed with a majority of the votes coming from Democrats. And uh, the continuing resolution basically will just punt for 45 days. And um, uh, broadly, it seems like uh, Democrats in the Senate and in the House and Republicans in both the Senate and the House think that the Ukraine aid is going to be added in its standalone bill uh, over the next two or three weeks. But here is AOC. What's your take on what just happened on on the, the threat of a government shutdown and just the whole experience? Well, I think the Republican Party right now is completely out of step with the American people. And what we saw today and what we saw this week leading up to this final hour, you know, compromise, not even a compromise, but really capitulation by the Republican Party, we saw them go through every single possible iteration of cutting cutting benefits. They tried to cut across the board 30% mm-hmm. of the budgets of critical agencies like the Social Security Administration. They, they voted some of the mo- most moderate members, quote unquote, moderate members of the Republican Party, casted votes for things like 80% cuts under the Department of Education to low-income schools. This is not a moderate party, period. There are not moderates in the Republican Party. There are just different degrees of fealty to Donald Trump. Uh, But it starts with a lot of fealty, and then it goes to extreme fealty. Uh, And so we saw them go through every single iteration, walk through into every single wall, kind of run around the house like a Roomba and until they found a door that House Democrats opened, they finally realized that we should not shut down the government in order to deny trans service members the ability to get health care, in order to deny female service members the ability to get an abortion. And, you know, they filed an extension for 45 days until we're back in here. So I'll tell you what I, I love about this messaging. Okay, just from a sheer, first off, for whatever reason, every single person in the administration and the leadership of the Democrats have all settled because of whatever focus group that they, 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 they finally settled on MAGA Republicans. <laughs> and you notice, she's not saying that. In fact, she is specifically addressing and critiquing that, uh, that whole construct. She says, um, the only difference, there, none of them are not extreme. This is an extreme party. There are no Republican moderates. The only difference between one Republican and another Republican is how much they bow down to Donald Trump. And it it ranges from they just get on their knees to they literally lie themselves on the ground and allow him to walk all over them. And, And that's exactly what should be going on here. There shouldn't be MAGA Republicans and then the implication being that there are regular Republicans. There are no regular Republicans. They are all extreme. The only difference is some of them um, channel their extreme their extremeness through a like as close a proximity to Donald Trump as they can get. The rest of them are cutting aid for you know for starving children. Yeah, and it's it's good messaging in that sense because the Republicans have never afforded the Democrats that same courtesy to distinguish between, say, the squad, who they would say is extreme, and Nancy Pelosi. They're calling Biden a socialist. I mean, it's ridiculous. So yeah. I, it, it, the, the, the Democrats, would it would behoove them to be clear-eyed about that, but for my entire life on this planet, that has not been the case. No, and it's not the same to my life, although... <laughs> You, what you don't get is, which we, we didn't have one, uh, you know, f- even 15 years ago, were any Democrats right. getting on a weekend uh, cable show and talking like this and basically saying, like, you know, I don't like your framing and I'm going to push a, a better one. And, and here it is. Um, She's also been doing that on immigration, I will say. There have been a lot of messaging gaps with the way that the Biden administration has responded to Republican framing. And it's unfortunate that, like, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has to take up that mantle, but it's good that she's there to do so. Because otherwise, it's just a complete vacuum, and the the right will fill that 
fill that void. You can't just ignore them. Um, you have to provide a counter narrative. She, uh, we played that clip of her talking about how there's essentially no alternative on immigration. It's just more militants, more criminalization. What is our alternate vision? Has there been any messaging the entire time Biden's been in office about the border that hasn't just been a, a variation of what the right has to say? Yeah, which is, That's just one example. They say, no, we are doing it, which yeah. is like to, about border. Exactly. Issues. Yeah, exactly. We all agree that we have to be draconian. It's just a question of like, how draconian can we be without being, you know, having images of our draconianness uh, out. But nevertheless, um, this is good. Uh, this is good messaging because you must extract as much of a political price as you can from this failure of the Republicans to actually uh, run uh, the the majority in a way that is like in, in a, any way responsible. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen in 45 days, but already you've had like the stress that you have created in hundreds of thousands, if not uh, millions of workers in this country, federal workers, uh, private workers who have got federal contracts, the inability you have for our government to function properly when it can anticipate what its budget's going to be six weeks from now, seven months from now, a year from now, or whatnot. Um, they must pay a political price. And she's out there basically just saying, you know, one, they're all extreme ideologically. Two, it's just a question of how, um, uh, you know, how much they're going to, how high they're going to jump when Donald Trump uh, says jump. And three, they don't know how to run anything. They're completely incompetent. They're bouncing around like, the, like a Roomba vacuum, she says. And it wasn't until the Democrats decided we're going to help you out. And uh, so that we can get the uh, country's business going forward. That's exactly the story that should be told about these people. And it's a very easy one to sell because it is exactly accurate. All right. In a moment, we're going to be talking to Ian Milheiser about uh, the upcoming Supreme Court uh, term. And then later, Mark Bankston, uh, litigator, litig litigator for the plaintiff in this uh, lawsuit against Elon Musk. It's a big one. Uh, but first off, um, I will tell you, uh, my daughter just came home for a day. I purchased four pairs of cozy earth socks. Mm -hmm. Um, why? Because, uh, I found their sheets to be incredibly, uh, comfortable, very soft. Uh, there's other things I like about the sheets, but that's not what I'm talking about right now. And, uh, also I got, um, uh, now I have now two uh, pairs of joggers cause I made the mistake of wearing one to a softball game. And I made the other mistake of sliding oh. because, but they're incredibly comfortable. They're also like, you can actually wear them outside. Like right. I never really knew this about, uh, but, that but here's the point. Public. All my socks have been stolen. Yeah. I don't have any more. So oh. I've got to buy more. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not implicating my daughter in this, <laughs> but it is quite a coincidence. Um, but you have definitely heard, uh, bettings, uh, and you know, uh, clothing companies say they're the softest, but I'm telling you at cozy earth, you get the softest, most luxurious feeling fabric, and it's a guarantee. That means if you don't love Cozy Earth's bamboo sheets, you got 100 days to get your money back. If you don't love their uh, socks, you're a lunatic, but you also have 100 days to get your money back. Um, we have teamed up with Cozy Earth. We, they are offering you 40% off at CozyEarth.com. Enter majority at checkout. 40% off. Their uh, uh, bedding is made, or sheets anyways, are made with viscous from bamboo. Incredibly soft. The thing I really love about them um, is uh, temperature regulating. Mm. Uh, they don't get too hot. And uh, that, for me, is the most important thing if I want to get some sleep. Um, and But like I say, all of the apparel stuff, I never thought I would like loungewear or what, uh, what is it? Yeah, loungewear. Called? Yeah, and now I do. Uh, they get softer with every wash too. I would say the, the sheets, the, the loungewear, I, if it got any softer, I don't know what would happen. Uh, the socks are also amazing. They don't, they don't say anything about that in this ad, but the, the socks are incredible. Very, very soft. Um, and cozy earth mission basically f help you find sanctuary in your daily life. Their luxury bedding and lounge war transforms lives by offering the softest, most luxurious, and responsibly sourced products in the world. Bamboo is basically a weed, folks. Um, and they start with selecting only the best suppliers with an eye towards quality, responsible production, and cutting-edge technology, premium 
materials. Again, premium 100% viscous from bamboo fabric. It feels like a cloud. Direct supply chain, ethical factories, uh, durable and machine washable, all these things Cozy Earth provides. Um, and like I say, 100-day return policy. They also included a 10-year uh, warranty against defects. You can save up to 40% on Cozy Earth today. Go to CozyEarth.com. Enter my code, pro, uh, promo code MAJORITY at checkout. Save up to 40% now. Try them for 100 nights. If you don't feel the difference, send them back for a full refund. That's CozyEarth.com, promo code MAJORITY. We will put the link in the podcast and YouTube description. Quick break. Ian Milheiser talk about this uh, term of the Supreme Court. We are back. Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. It is a real pleasure to uh, welcome back to the program Ian Milheiser, senior correspondent at Vox, to give us a preview of the highlights, lowlights <laughs> of uh, the next Supreme Court term. Uh, Ian, uh, welcome back. Always great to have you. It's good to be here. I mean, unfortunately, it's my mournful and highly regrettable duty to inform you that the Supreme Court is back in session. <laughs> yes. Oh, boy. Um, yeah. it, is, it has really been the past couple of years uh, have really um, uh, been every time we talk has been sort of upsetting and depressing. Um, uh, much of this Supreme Court, at least now, in terms of we look forward, is going to be taken up by dealing with uh, perhaps the only other more crazy court in the country than the Supreme Court. I want to get to that in a moment. But let's get to the one thing that um, you and I have been having conversations about, I feel like, for five or six years now. Yeah. Um, and that is the um, the biggest threat to the Chevron Doctrine um, at least this year, um, it, that, that are going to be taking place, um, uh, this year. And it comes in the form of, uh, Loper Bright, is it entertainment or uh, enterprises and Raimondo, um, a, a yep. fairly, what seems like on its face, a fairly banal case, but could have massive implications. Tell, tell us about that one. Sure. So the backstory here is that the Supreme Court has been in the has been engaged in a fairly long process of essentially seizing power from the executive branch of government and giving it to itself. So there are a lot of statutes passed by Congress that says that various executive branch agencies, the EPA, the Department of Labor, the Department of Education, what have you, have various authority to do all kinds of things. Um, you know, the most recent example of this was in the student loan case. Congress passed a law called the HEROES Act, which says that the Department of Education has very broad power to modify or cancel student loans during a national emergency. And the Supreme Court recently said, no, he doesn't actually have that power, be, you know, because we now have the authority to overrule the executive branch. What the court has relied on in its most recent past decisions overruling the executive branch is something called the major questions doctrine, which, as the name implies, it, it suggests that when executive branch do something really when the executive branch does something really consequential, when a federal agency does something really big, like forgive a lot of student loans, then the courts can step in and they can veto whatever it is that this agency has done. The what remains of the Chevron doctrine. All right, wait, can we just stop at the major questions doctrine for a moment just to sure. show the absurdity of this? This is something that no Supreme Court justice had uttered those words 
uh, I think, prior to the 21st century, right? I mean, it was just something that vaguely was sort of thrown offhand. I think it was, was it by Scalia at one point or um, like, like 15 years ago? And we don't know what major means, right? right? There's no way, yeah, like so nobody can define major. It's, it's one of those things the court has, like we know it when we see it. Yeah. So the history here is in like, two, I believe the year 2000, the Supreme Court struck down the FBA, the FDA's attempt to assert control over tobacco. And it's a very long opinion. So it's called uh, FDA v. Brown and Williamson. Um, the court gives many reasons why it concludes that Congress did not intend the FDA to be able to regulate t- tobacco. Many reasons. It's a pretty, it's a pretty convincing opinion. Um, and one of the many reasons it gives is after listing all kinds of evidence that Congress didn't intend the FDA to regulate tobacco. It then includes this one brief section that's maybe four or five paragraphs going on. It says, and one other thing that gives us pause here is tobacco is kind of a big deal. There's, you know, there's been a lot of political contention around tobacco. And we would think that if Congress wanted to give the FDA this kind of power, they would provide a clearer statute giving them with that power. So that was one of many reasons that the court cited in a very lengthy opinion, laying out all the reasons why they thought in the year 2000 that the FDA did not have the authority to regulate tobacco. Flash forward to the Obama years, and the Supreme Court started hinting that it wanted to expand that and say that if the court, if a federal agency does something too big, we might strike it down. Um, But it was mostly just hinting that this could be something that could be coming. This doctrine then laid dormant for the entire Trump administration. So the whole time a Republican was in the White House, they didn't even mention that there might be limits on the executive branch. Amazing that there were no major questions during the Trump years. Yeah, I mean, and it's not like Trump didn't like do anything big with his executive power. I mean, there was a freaking Muslim ban during during the Trump administration. But is that major? Yeah, I, well, according to the Supreme Court, no, because they okay. didn't bring up the major question okay. doctrine. They know it when they see it. Mandate. So major essentially is dictated by the fact of how uh, how major is something that you're going to, a bill, to build um, that might threaten industry as opposed to breaking something down. Because that's what the right does effectively, right? They're, they're fine with taking major blows to the way that our federal agencies are, are operate. But if the federal agency tries to do something actively, proactively, that's when it's major, it seems. Yeah. So the language that the Supreme Court has used is that when something has vast economic or political, that's the phrase that is used, economic or political consequences, then they're more likely to step in and impose the major questions doctrine. That word political is really significant because what it essentially means is if the Republican Party whines enough about something, oh. This has huge political question implications. Look at all the controversy that that, right. that, that, it, that it has inspired. And therefore, we have the right to veto it. And, and that's that's what they did in the student loans case. That's what they did in a case striking down something called the Clean Power Plan, which was an, which is an Obama era um, plan to fight climate change that they recently struck down. Um, and so, like, the major questions doctrine, the way that it really functions is it's just if the Republican Party gets really upset about something, then the courts can step in and strike it down. So that has been the what they've they've used to sort of in, uh, sort of around the edges of the Chevron doctrine. Right. But tell us what the Chevron doctrine is and how it's implicated in this case coming up. Yeah. So Chevron is a case from the mid 80s, which said that. When agencies, when it's unclear if an agency has the power to do something that it wants to do, when it's when like when the actual statute giving it the power to do something is ambiguous, then court should generally defer to the agency's interpretation of that statute. And the reason why is twofold. One is that the agency knows more about the subject matters it regulates than the courts do. So it's more likely to get questions right when it's unclear what, what the law says. But the the other reason and the other reason why is that an agency is responsive to or, you know, is responsible to a democratically elected president. A court is not. And so it's more leg- democratically legitimate to say, like, hey, let, let the agency what it's going to do, what it's going to do. And if the people don't like it, they can replace the president in the new election. They can't replace 
the justices in the in in, in the new election. So, so Chevron. So, so in other words, an example of that would be um, Congress has said to the EPA, "We passed the Clean Air Act. If you find pollutants in there that are bad for human beings, uh, to keeping them alive, you, you have the authority to take that out. And, you know, you have the authority to regulate that." And at one point, um, the EPA finds that, like, hey, mercury is bad for human beings. And this amount, we're going to uh, say no more mercury can be burned into the air or dumped into the sea or whatever it is. And the even though Congress never said mercury, right. they just said something vague. And then the court under Chevron would defer to the EPA. They know what they're doing. And if if the, the American public has such a problem with so little uh, mercury in the air, they can vote out the 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 president at that time. That's right. And, and again, like the Chevron doctrine doesn't say agencies can do whatever the hell they want. You know, w what it says is that if the statute is genuinely unclear. So like if we're imagining a hypothetical statute that said the EPA shall have the power to ban pollution that releases harmful substances and it doesn't define the term harmful substances then under chevron you know if the epa determines that mercury is a is a harmful substance then court should generally defer to the epa's determination there um chevron like you know if the statute said um congress can or the epa can ban harmful substances except for mercury you know if you had a statute this isn't like that that is an unambiguous statute and right. so the EPA doesn't have the power to ignore what Congress has said, but when the statute is genuinely ambiguous, Chevron says that we want the agency to make the determination because it has the expertise and the democratic legitimacy to make that decision and not a bunch of unelected judges. Fair enough. Okay. And so, uh, Ramondo, why does this case, uh, what, this case is, is one where the Chevron doctrine could be basically taken on uh, uh, like uh, uh, dead aim. They're taking dead aim at the Chevron doctrine. Yeah. So this case asked the Supreme Court to overrule Chevron, which would mean that all these, like basically every regulatory decision made by a federal agency, the agency would no longer have the last word on whether that regulation stands. The judiciary would have the last word on whether that regulation stands. And again, under its major questions decision, the court has already said that it has a, basically an unlimited veto power over important regulations. So what this Loper, what this Loper Bright decision um, deals with is essentially whether the courts are going to micromanage every other thing that federal agencies are doing. And I mean, first of all, I don't know why the courts would want that power, like. The specific issue in the Loper Bright decision is that there is a regulation which says, first of all, that certain fishing boats have to have a federal monitor on board just to see what they're up to. And second of all, that that monitor has to be paid for by the owner of the boat. And the owner of a boat is challenging that, saying that, no, they don't want to, to, pay, to pay for this monitor. This is a tiny issue. Like, no one really cares except for boat owners. Well, Ian, do you own a boat? I mean, that's the situation here, right? Is like they're representing when they can when they can uh, uh, pick and choose in the situation and they have the power to do so. The, for the most things, uh, part I would imagine they'll let things slide, except when they have some sort of industry group or, you know, Harlan Crow calls up and it's about a real estate regulation and that's when they invoke it that's why they want the power to pick and choose because then they get to choose yeah i mean that's the danger there is that the court's just going to start imposing its own policy preferences and the republican party's policy preferences because six of the justice are republicans on pretty much any regulation out there um like the reason why i describe this this one regulation in this case is because it's so low stakes i mean like if you want to do the economic analysis here if the fishing company has to pay for the person on the boat that it that doesn't actually cost that much money they're just going to spread that around to their consumers and you'll pay maybe a few pennies more for a piece of cod alternatively if the government has to pay for this person to be on the boat then you'll pay maybe a fraction of a cent more in taxes 
in order to cover the cost of the government paying. So like the the stakes here are virtually not existent. Like it, it, it just doesn't matter that much, you know, who, who pays for this observer. But in the aggregate, if the courts are suddenly second guessing every single, you know, every time the federal government makes a decision about anything, you know, how much, you know, emissions can be re can be reduced by nitrogen treating plants. What are the proper procedures for determining if someone has um, is entitled to black lung benefits? You, you know, what should be the rules governing safety rails at a particular factory? You know, all of these tiny decisions that, that that the government has to make that impact some people, but that don't have huge stakes. You know, who do you want deciding? who decides what the safety rails look like at a factory? Do you want OSHA, an agency that actually knows a lot about safety rails at factories to make that decision? Or do you want Neil Gorsuch to make that decision? You know, well, that, that's what's at stake here. It also seems to me like, I mean, there, there are two things that occur to me. One, that for all, for, for the, the, the real, for the most implications, Chevron has been essentially um, uh, dismantled. I mean, for the big questions, like we, you know, we've seen it in terms of like student loan. When I mean, you're talking, you know, and uh, we we saw it with the uh, Clean Water Act, uh, and I think we're going to see it for for other things come forward. Major questions doctrine is basically like this sort of like get out of free jail, get out of jail free for uh, for people who are you know scoff laws or or you know who, uh, it, it, and it just trumps everything. It's like a wild card that they can play at any time. The, the implications of this seem to me to be, um, you would create just a tremendous amount of chaos because every single person, I, I have a, you know, uh, a pest control business. The FDA says I can't use this, uh, this thing to spray it around uh, kids and animals. Well, <laughs> I'm not doing that. You know, the Chevron doctrine has gone or whatnot. And, we would just get a ton of these things and things would go into chaos. Uh, but, but in terms of the major questions, it, it, that, that game seems to be over more or less. Yeah, no, that, that's exactly right. Yeah. The major questions doctrine has essentially established that when the Republican party feels very, very strongly about something that a government agency has done, then the Supreme court can step in and veto this thing that the Republican party doesn't like. And like, there's a lot of big, important things there. I mean, you know, the, the, you know, lots of your listeners probably are, are going, not getting their student loans canceled are going to, you know, are, are out a whole lot of money because of the Supreme court's major questions doctrine. You, you know, the, the, you know, they canceled out, Obama's biggest plan to to fight climate change, although actually the clean power plan did, wouldn't have done much anyway. But at the time, we thought it was going to do a lot. Um, so, like you know, the major questions doctrine. When there's something that the Republican Party really hates, the Supreme Court already has the power to veto it. All the right. question here is everything else, and everything else is a big category. You know, the the, the Code of Federal Regulations is about 200 volumes long. There's just a lot of stuff in there, and again, the question is like. When you're dealing with something like, you know, how much wastewater can be re can be released by or how much waste can be released by a nitrogen treatment plant? I don't know the answer to that. I'm a lawyer. I, you know, nothing I learned in law school taught, 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 taught me taught me anything about, you know, waste released by nitrogen treatment plants. Nothing that Neil Gorsuch learned in law school taught him anything about that either. He has no clue what the proper answer to that is. You know who does know the answer to that question? The EPA, because it's their job to know the answer to that question. And so, you know, the, you know, just think about 200 volumes worth of things that like well thought out experts have, have decided here's the best way to do things. And now we're just going to pick a bunch of rando lawyers with black robes and say they get to decide those instead. Um, all right, I want to move on, but I just want to note one thing about the Chevron doctrine. Uh, my understanding is that that case that forged the Chevron doctrine, Gorsuch's mom was the head of the EPA at that time. <laughs> I, I think she'd had to resign by the time the case actually reached the Supreme Court. But yeah, I mean, the th important thing to understand about not just Chevron, but like this issue of whether a court should defer to the executive branch uh, is the courts 
moved in the direction of deference of saying that we should, you know, let the executive do, you know, do what it needs to do during the Reagan administration. And Republicans were really hot on Chevron at the time because Reagan was pro was promoting a deregulatory agenda. They wanted Ronald Reagan to be deferred to. When did they start talking about rolling in the Chev Chevron doctrine? Well, that Brown and Williamson case, the, the tobacco case I told you about, that was something Bill Clinton did. You know, and then they, you know, they did a little bit of rolling back on, on under Barack Obama. They then like didn't mention any of this at all under Donald Trump. And then all of a sudden they create this huge expansive major questions doctrine, which which has only been used to strike down regulations pushed by the Biden administration. So look, I believe in democracy. Amazing coincidences. Amazing coincidences, you know. I believe in democracy. I believe that Ronald Reagan won two elections fair and square. And if the American people wanted Ronald Reagan's deregulatory agenda, then like he should get to implement it. But we've had quite a number of elections since then. Ronald Reagan's approach has fallen out of favor with the American public. And the Supreme Court should honor that as well. Fair enough. I agree. Um, all right. Let's go to um, the the other bulk of the cases as, as of now, anyways, that uh, the court's going to hear. And those are sort of like, uh, they're coming out of the fifth circuit. Just tell us a little bit about the fifth circuit, because this is the, I mean, this sounds like the strategy was you get a circuit that's going to create all of these. That's basically going to be a pipeline to the Supreme court because it's going to find, uh, it's going to be the, the sort of, um, I don't know, the, the USS Enterprise, the Star Trek uh, version here. We're going to go place, we're going to cross boundaries that we've never crossed before to see where where we are at the Supreme Court. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, I, I would make more of a Star Wars joke than a Star Trek joke, if we took about the Fifth Circuit, because there's no greater hive of scum and villainy in the federal judiciary. <laughs> okay, um, fair. Yeah, the, the, the Fifth Circuit is, and there's just... There's just no charitable way to put it. It is a bench dominated by cranks. Um, you know, Donald Trump appointed six people to the Fifth Circuit. It had long been a particularly extreme court. And now, I, I mean, the stuff coming out of the court right now doesn't even resemble law. So, like... And to, just to be clear, I just so that people know, because I'm not sure people are familiar with this, there are 13 circuits around the country. This one yeah. represents... Uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Texas for the that's most right. part, right? I mean, there may be, uh, I, I'm not sure, that's just broadly speaking. And so if you sit on that court, you're basically nominated with the blessing of the senators from those states. So you get a sense of like who the the filter is, uh, just yeah. to be clear. And, yeah. uh, and, and like you say, six appointed by Trump, 12 by Republicans, out of the 18. Yeah. So they, yeah, the history of how the Fifth Circuit got to be so crazy is that there is this thing called the blue slip, which used to mean that any judge nominated from, or at least under, during the Obama administration, when Senator Leahy took it a little too seriously, um, basically home state senators had an unlimited power to veto any judicial nominee to a federal judgeship in their state. And so, you know, we're talking about Texas here. That means that Ted Cruz had an right. unlimited veto power over anyone appointed to one of the Fifth Circuit seats in Texas. You know, the Mississippi senators had an unlimited veto power. And so, like, Obama, I mean, I think I think he appointed one or two judges to the Fifth Circuit. But, like, there was basically a blockade. And Trump came into office with a bunch of Fifth Circuit vacancies that should have been filled by Obama. And then Trump filled all of those, plus all the vacancies that opened up while he was president. And so that's why you had this court that was already fairly extreme that just became loopy. And so to give you a sense of the loopy stuff they have done. So there's a case being argued tomorrow, actually, um, where the Fifth Circuit declared the entire Consumer Financial Protection Bureau unconstitutional. Now, if this entire CFPB is unconstitutional, that means we have basically no consumer banking regulations. It also means like there's a bunch of laws that banks have to comply with. 
And the banks need someone to write rules telling them, like, in specific detail, how to comply with those rules. Like, if, if you've ever signed a mortgage before, you know, all those documents that you have to sign that use all that thick boilerpoint point language, many of those documents are written by the CFPB. And if the banks don't, if the CFPB doesn't exist, the banks don't know how to comply with the disclosure rules and various laws that they, that they have to comply with which means that they cannot issue mortgages. And if they cannot issue mortgages, then we potentially lose 17% of the US economy overnight, and that's a Great Depression level event. So you, you, know, you, you have the Fifth Circuit handing down this decision that makes no sense. I mean, I can go into why they said that the entire federal agency is unconstitutional, but it makes no sense that would have sweeping catastrophic consequences for the world economy. You know, I mean, we, we would do more damage to the United States than like anything since Pearl Harbor, uh, you know, or, and, you know, this is the kind of reasoning that we've got coming out of the Fifth Circuit. And it's based on a very sort of bizarre reading of uh, Congress's ability to appropriate uh, to to, you know, uh, appropriate funds and um, and to, I guess, to, to sort of, you know, decide how uh, it, I mean, it's it's specifically written in there. I don't know how they interpret it that way. I mean, the, the language in the in the Constitution is you can't uh, spend money from the Treasury unless Congress says you can. And right. Congress says you can here in this situation. That's it. But OK, tell us some more of these cases, because th there's going to be a series of these things. At one point, does the Supreme Court say, hey, Fifth Circuit, take it easy. Yeah. Like I mean, you're, you're to taking up honest, too much time. I, to be honest, I am fairly optimistic that the that the Supreme Court's going to lay some smackdown on the Fifth Circuit. You know, they, they have laid a little bit of smackdown already in previous terms on the Fifth Circuit. I mean, look, I don't like Amy Coney Barrett. I don't think she's a particularly good judge. I, I, I don't appreciate the fact that she voted to overrule Roe v. Wade. I don't appreciate that she supports the major questions doctrine. I don't like a lot of things that she does. She's not a terrorist. Like, she, she, she doesn't actively want to destroy the United States or, like, set a nuclear bomb off in the middle of our economy. And that's what would happen if the Fifth Circuit was affirmed in the CFPB case. So, like, I, I'm fairly confident the Fifth Circuit is going to get a big old fist brought down upon them there. Uh, are um, there other ca cases? I know you just got a couple minutes here. Uh, are there other cases that you think that the Fifth Circuit is pushing that is going to be uh, problematic? Well, so there's one case that I do want to discuss. This is a case called U.S. v. Rahimi. Um, the law here, which the Fifth Circuit struck down, is a law saying that if a court has determined, so if you have a, a restraining order against you, because a court has determined that you are a violent threat either to your romantic partner or to your romantic partner's child, then you may not own a gun. So, like, to be clear who we're talking about, this is there's been a court proceeding. The court has determined if this individual has a gun, they may use it to try to kill their wife, to kill their girlfriend, or to kill their girlfriend's child. These, this is the universe of people we're talking about here. The Fifth Circuit struck that law down. The Fifth Circuit said that wife beaters have a constitutional right to own a gun. And, and this like, is because and this is because of the New York State uh, yeah. case, right, yeah. which and, where where the, the Supreme Court said our gun laws have to look like they did in 1776. Exactly. And like there that brings me to the worst part of this Rahimi case. The worst part of the Fifth Circuit's decision in Rahimi is I think they, they got it right. I think that like if you accept that that previous Supreme Court decision, Bruin which said that you have to look at what the gun laws looked like at the founding to figure out which gun laws we can have now. Well, it was legal to beat your spouse in all 50 states until 17, until 1871. It wasn't until 1871 that the Alabama Supreme Court of, of all states ruled that it was, that it was you could indict someone for, for beating their spouse. So, you know, and then there were 49 states where, you know, you, it, was, it was still legal. So, you know, if you accept what the Supreme Court said in Bruin, that we have to tie our gun laws to what the gun laws looked like in 1789, 
then yeah, I, I guess you have a constitutional right to own a gun, even if you are a violent threat to your own spouse. And just to be clear, the law says that the that there has to be a hearing to adjudicate this. So their law Correct. is not like making a sweeping assessment. It's saying that we, we're going to leave it up to the courts to be able to like look at this person and, and make this determination. So the, the long and short of it is that this case is going to force the Supreme Court to reevaluate what they did in Bruin. Right. And it's going to be it's got to be embarrassing for them. It's easy. I, mean, I, I would hope so. Again, like. Operating on the theory that Brett and Amy are not terrorists, like, I think any normal person hears this case, the, the holding of this case that I described, that people who a court has determined are a physical danger to their spouse, to the romantic partner, to the romantic partner's child, has the right to own a gun. Any normal person hears this. No, that's wrong. That cannot possibly be correct. Um, what I think is likely to happen is that Kavanaugh wrote a concurring opinion in Bruin where he said there are some categorical carve outs to the Fifth Amendment or to the Second Amendment. So, like, you can't own dangerous and unusual weapons. You can't bring guns into sensitive places. I think the court will probably create a dangerous person's carve out or something like that. So if you've been determined to be a dangerous person by a court, then you can be disarmed. But again, like, it's it's a pretty spooky case because, like, you know, most of the time when I rag on the Fifth Circuit, it's because I think that they did something completely lawless. Here, I think they follow the law. The problem is that Bruin is insane. Yeah, it's, and I think it's going to make it really clear. I mean, the more carve-outs they have to have to this sort of like magical, we go back to the, what they were thinking in 1789, except for in these instances where we realize that's not workable, is just ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, Ian, I know you got to run. We, uh, I hope we can uh, do this again because... Um, as the cases uh, are heard, um, it really appreciate your insight to these things. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me, Sam. Thanks, Ian. All right, folks. Um, uh, again, Ian had to uh, run. We were lucky to get him uh, for that long. I want to use the major questions doctrine uh, to regulate firearms so that if we're going back to the original intent of uh, when those laws were passed to make them as difficult to use as they were back when the country was founded. So like you got to load up your musket, got to take 45 seconds, baby. That's how guns are going to be uh, 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 produced in this country at this point. The the well, the major questions doctrine wouldn't I know I know but but really I'm what we're talking about is yeah I mean this is going to be um, and that is what you're going to be covering in thirty years uh, when there is a majority of non right wing lunatics on the court uh, and um, you can I don't know when I'm in the home uh, that I the facility I'll be in. And I'll be listening to the show, mm -hmm. and uh, I'll be like, uh, I'll probably just scream, and the the you know the the nurses will come over. What's the matter? And I'll be like, it finally happened. <laughs> the the and they'll go there. The, there. the center right judges uh, use the major uh, questions doctrine to say that you can only own a musket, <laughs> and they'll all look at me like, oh, there he is, the old man Cedar. Um, I mean, this is, yeah, I mean, it's just uh, the beat goes on. This is what we, uh, this was one of the inevitabilities, potential inevitabilities of having a, uh, a Republican win in that era. And, you know, there's. Hmm, a we, bunch of working people are going to be uh, unburdened from uh, debt bondage. I have a major question about that. Yeah. Exactly. Um, let's just do this um, uh, quickly we're in, in about uh, eight minutes. Um uh, uh, we're going to be talking to Mark Bankston. He's a litigator at Farrar and Ball. And there's this uh, case. I think we're, we are the first um, a news outlet, as it were, to be talking uh, to, um, to Mark Bankston. Uh, he is of the Texas law firm that um, had represented two Sandy Hook parents. They won $45 million uh, in damages against uh, Alex Jones in the Texas case. This one uh, is about Elon Musk, um, who essentially like weighed in, as far as I know, and we'll hear more details from Bankston, weighed in um, on 
Twitter, now called X, uh, about a conspiracy theory that this 22-year-old uh, guy from California um, was a man in a mask, part of a neo-Nazi group, uh, the neo-Nazi group Rose City Nationalists and Proud Boys in uh, Oregon, some event. And Musk was like saying, this guy, random guy from California, was this man in the mask and it proved that it was a false flag uh, operation. Um, it's What's really important about this is that we have a, a right-wing billionaire who is actively promoting misinformation on his platform and participating in it. He's been tweet tweeting out just standard Facebook Republican dad anti-vax stuff recently. And uh, also New York is uh, a teaming with immigrants uh, stuff. Yeah, I also saw that I'm going to try to find the meme uh, exactly that he, he tweeted out, but it was some anti-vax thing. And it was like, keep taking the vaccine that's so... Uh, for a disease that's so bad that you need to get a test to uh, figure out if you have it or not. And I saw someone in the replies being like, that's cancer too, you idiot. <laughs> you oh need God, a test so to dumb. determine if you get cancer. Um, all right. Before we get to uh, that, um, let's just deal with another uh, conspiracy theory. In the run-up to the series of votes that were happening uh, about the continuing resolution in the House... And there was at one point where, you know, Democrats were looking, I guess, to stall a vote, maybe to try and assess how they were going to vote on one thing or another, some strategy. Um, people were leaving uh, the building or coming into the building or where I don't know where exactly uh, Bowman was going. But um, he was in the Cannon office building. He going, was in the office going building, to going, the, to the Capitol, going to the Capitol to vote. And he was trying to hurry. Right. And. He led off in the Cannon office building. Which is adjacent to the Capitol. Well, right? it's not adjacent. It's across the street. Oh. Um, uh, the fire alarm. And the fire alarm is right by the doors to exit. And this whole thing has been that uh, Bowman did it to create a distraction, ostensibly, to, to hold up the vote for whatever reason. It's unclear. And uh, go down. No, no. Stuff. Show what they released first. This is what was released by the Republican uh, leadership in the House. Video camera footage, not the entire video, just this picture. Yeah, they, the video they had, which is Still. important, they, that have they haven't the video, released. But they've just they have released the this, right? And it's Bowman pulling the alarm. He's got papers in his hand. Uh, he's clearly headed over to the vote. And they only show this picture as, as evidence. But apparently somebody went in and got, looked at what the the sign was yeah, on the, the door there. Go back to the original one. Yeah, go back to, go the, back original to the original. Go back to the original uh, picture. Yeah. And let's pop, pop you this You can up. see in the, in the window there, there there's two uh, rectangular signs right by above the handle on the bottom. Left. Yes. Yeah. Now let's go in and see what, that, what those doors say. This is what it says. He's running out of the building. Emergency exit only. Push until alarm sounds. Three seconds. Door will unlock in 30 seconds. So if you can't get out the door and you see the sign, emergency exit only. Well, he's in a, he's in a hurry. Push until alarm sounds. It's only going to go for three seconds. Or maybe you push for three seconds. And then, but within 30 seconds, the door will unlock and you'll be able to get out. Isn't that what that says? I don't quite understand. So does that, I, just me trying to interpret that, that means you push like the handle of the doors for three seconds. I would say, I would think like maybe if you get it before three seconds, you can get in and get out without the alarm going. I don't, I, it is unclear to me what this says um but either way i'm very suspicious and it was that. also the weekend which i also saw some people saying that there were you know different locking protocols and things like that so this might not have been his traditional exit strategy and he's rushing mm -hmm. to get 
to the vote. I think he's trying to do CRT on us. I mean, I saw freaking cat turd, you know, one of those like right wing accounts that Elon Musk uh, promotes on, over on, on Twitter. Well, it's the trouble in paradise on that front. But anyway, OK, a... well, I haven't kept up with the latest stupid drums on that front. But uh, it tweeted Representative Jamal Bowman's fire alarm attack today was the biggest threat to our democracy since the <laughs> founding of our country. Congressman Troy Nels of uh, Texas in the Freedom Caucus. Um, he has that in his bio. I thought you weren't supposed to say you were in the Freedom Caucus. Uh, he's kind of violating one of, the, one of the cool rules of Fight Club. Tweeted out a photo of him holding up handcuffs and said, Jamal, are you ready? Like, they're going to lock him up and throw away the key over this. So they're just running uh, running with the the, I mean complete i won't i want to say racial undertones but overtones yeah, of this what the black guy did right. yeah like to say what what was the strategy really be for jamal bowman there except for just complete confusion has anyone ever not opened up a door that accidentally set off an alarm before that uh, that's happened to me oh shoot i'm not supposed to go there and some bell starts ringing or like yeah seen like a lot uh, doors that were supposedly alarmed, but actually you can go through those. Like there's oh, a yeah. rooftop door that I used to go to in yeah, oh, my friend's uh, place. I do it on the subway, know, the subway every, every time. Day. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of going through the turnstile, yeah. you go through the, the door because people are coming through the turnstile, whatever. Go, uh, Sorry, New Yorkers are just cooler and more uh, cavalier about uh, See, that solves doors. it. Yeah. He he was doing the subway exit strategy. He didn't want to go through the turnstiles. That doesn't take as much. I that mean, takes if, too much time. If this was a big nefarious plot, don't you think he would just be like, hey, dude, in my office, go go pull the uh, alarm. Yeah, why would he do it himself? <laughs> <laughs> that actually says a lot to him. If it was a conscious strategy, he's like, no, I'm not going to have some staff record. I'm going to do this really, myself. Yeah. Not the intern who could we? But also, why lost. would you pull it in the Canon office building? Yeah, you would and do think it in the that Capitol. This is going to prevent the uh, the yeah. vote. It's just so dumb. But this is look. The Republicans right now are absolutely desperate to not have people talk about what a crap show this has been for them. Um, all right, we're going to take a quick break. And in a second, we'll be back with Mark Bankston. He is a litigator at Farrar and Ball. Uh, this is, uh, and he is the attorney who represented two of the Sandy Hook parents who won $45 million in damages against Alex Jones. He is now uh, representing uh, a guy named Ben Brody, a 22-year-old uh, guy from California who filed a lawsuit against Elon Musk after he said he and his family were forced to flee their home because of continued harassment and threats after Musk promoted a dangerous conspiracy theory against Brody. And of course, he did it on his own personal social media um, uh, uh, account. Platform, the, guy who accused, the guy who accused that submarine operator of being a sus and maybe a pedo guy um, because he was helping kids and didn't want to help uh, use Elon's equipment for that. You remember that? I lawsuit? remember that. Guy. And he got off because it was just a joke. <laughs> which uh, He keeps no, making these jokes. It's yeah. really weird. All right. We'll be right back with uh, Mark Bankston. We are back, Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. Uh, I want to welcome to the program Mark Bankston, litigator at Farrar and Ball um, out of uh, Texas. And um, uh, Mark, uh, welcome to the program. We were just saying beforehand we were supposed to do. Uh, we were. We were. I was going to interview you about the 
uh, Alex Jones case, uh, I guess a year ago, maybe it was, or I can't That's remember right. in Vegas. And, and we'll, we'll catch up uh, again at the uh, Mass Torts Conference uh, uh, later. But in the meantime, um, you have a case that you are uh, handling for a guy named Ben Brody. Uh, tell us um, who Ben Brody is and welcome to the program. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Great to be here. Um, today we filed a lawsuit uh, on behalf of Ben Brody. He's a, uh, a young man out in California, a recent grad of UC Riverside, who was just sort of minding his own business in life. Uh, and turned out one night he was sitting at a Dodgers game and his phone starts blowing up because it turns out that Elon Musk had connected him to an accusation that he was a neo-Nazi rioter up in Portland. And it was, uh, it was a strange event for this young man, to say the least. Uh, Elon had seen some posts that were circulating around uh, where apparently somebody thought that Ben Brody looked like one of the unmasked neo-Nazis up in Portland. Uh, it started a, a big you know, conspiracy theory online. Musk has been really into this psyops false flag stuff. He jumped on it with both feet, started promoting it for days. Uh, then on the third day it was going around, he responded to the infamous Zero Hedge uh, and defamed Ben, said, yeah, it looks like it's this kid. Looks like he's the one. And, you know, a lot of people who had seen the rumor up until that point, it sort of transformed it into gospel for them. And it led to, you know, as I think you can imagine when Elon Musk calls attention to you, a large wave of very belligerent strangers. Uh, I don't need to them. imagine. Oh. I don't need to imagine. <laughs> I mean, I'm not trying to, because when I was on the Tim Pool show, Tim Pool accused me of uh, uh, being a pedophile without um, any uh, real evidence to black, any evidence to back that <laughs> up. You. Jesus, I'm trying to, why am I trying to be generous? Need to get lawyerly here. And Elon Musk responded, but at least, you know, he, uh, I have a platform and the ability to speak out about some of this stuff. I mean, you're doing this on behalf of your plaintiff who it was just is just a random guy basically just a young kid absolutely you know that's what i'm really making sure of is, is ben's terrified right now about what his future may be because employers may not want to hire somebody who has this neo-nazi controversy in their past they may want to hire somebody with an unblemished personal history and, right, let, and me just, know let me just clarify gonna... something. Mm -hmm. let me just clarify something so some random person on twitter was trying to identify who the neo Nazis were, Correct. they 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 probably took an image of the the picture of this person in there and ran it through maybe who knows what to assess that it was your client who was states away at a uh, ball game I guess or whenever it was, and um, because n the idea was it doesn't make sense that this guy is a neo Nazi he's some Jewish guy in uh, California, what's he doing up here if he's a neo-Nazi? And so Musk bought into, if not developed, the theory then, this must be a psyop because this guy's so clearly not a neo-Nazi, but it's so definitely him that like, he's making two leaps of assumptions and then sort of retconning that to make it like why to justify why he's doing this he spent this wasn't a casual thing that uh, the musk is doing he he really sort no. of like is building this thing well and you know it's it's interesting that if you look at where the allegation came from which is one of these extremist groiper nick fuentes followers who had posted a screenshot from ben's uh, his jewish fraternity where it had said ben after graduation plans to work for the government and they were all like aha we got him. He's a fed. He's some sort of provocateur. And then once this spread around, it was kind of confined to sort of far right wing circles. But then once Musk picked it up, well, then it becomes a totally different thing. And when you have that many followers, when you can get it in front of that many eyes, when you're that influential, the exponential effects are just incredible. Somebody who hasn't lived through it just doesn't know what it's like. Uh, and, and he just picked it up and ran with it, basically running the same theme that he had for the Allen shooting in Texas back in May where he was denying that that guy was a neo-Nazi. Mm -hmm. you know, it seems to be this running theme that this, this promotion of the idea that there are psyops or false flags used to trick the American public into believing that there's white supremacist violence. And that's the theme that he's been carrying forward with this. What, what do you have to prove in this? Like what, what exactly is the, um, what, what are, what is the suit here? Is it a 
defamation type suit? Is it, um, uh, tell us what the, the actual, um, sure. claim is. Sure. It's, it's a libel suit, a defamation suit. And, and in this case, it would be actually per se, because it essentially accuses Ben of criminal conduct of doing disorderly conduct of conspiracy to riot conspiracy to commit political terrorism. Uh, and in that kind of case, you have to prove four things. You have to prove that he published a statement. Second, you have to prove that it was over concerning Ben Brody. In other words, that people who read it understood that it referred to Ben Brody. Third, you have to prove that it was defamatory, right? That it gave a false statement that injures his reputation. And finally, you have to show that he suffered damages. And in this case, it's damage to his reputation, his public image, as well as the mental anguish and distress it's caused him. So those four elements in this case are, I mean, honestly, a slam dunk. Uh, this, this case is, is pretty textbook, what you're not supposed to do. When Elon says, hey, it looks like it's this college student who wants to join the government, when he's communicating that idea, that's not an opinion. That's a statement of fact that can be verified as true or false. When he says that kind of statement, he needs to exercise reasonable care. And here, it's not reasonable care to take some extremist groiper and take his, his post and then throw it out to the world because you think these two guys look alike. That is not reasonable conduct. I mean, even if Ben was a public figure, I would I would argue that this is absolutely malicious. But here, I mean, he's a private guy. When, when you're going to say things about private people, you have to use reasonable care if you're going to make this kind of accusation. And that did not happen here. How much did the Ray Epps suit have an uh, influence you in this way? And the fact that the, that Fox News is in some trouble here for doing something similar to uh, Ray Epps? I think what it shows is that... Um, there is a, a new type, a new pursuit of lawsuits that, that you know, I, I hope to, to think that I had some influence on that back in 2018 by suing Alex Jones for his false statements. Um, and we've seen a wave of them. We saw Rudy Giuliani sued by the poll workers. Uh, we've seen Ray Epps. Uh, these, these are a continuing type of suit now that people are, are starting to bring, are starting to understand that this has real importance and meaning beyond just the damage it does to the people, but in terms of, of, of a healthy public discussion. Um, and so, yeah, the, the Ray Epps suit is very similar to this one in a lot of ways, where you have someone being accused of being a provocateur, of, of lying about who they are, uh, to, to somehow affect our politics. And, and that type of defamation, unfortunately, has grown way, way too common. There are far too many powerful people who are being reckless in their statements about private individuals while trying to, to essentially push their political agenda. Okay, so let me go through some of that. Uh, what what is the um what the cutoff if you, this if this happened to a public figure now i've never i've never heard of ben brody before um and i don't know that really anybody had uh you know broadly speaking obviously but what constitutes a public figure in this instance and how is that in other cases a mitigating factor sure there are two types of public figures there's one as a general purpose public figure. Elon Musk is an example of that. Think of anybody who you can think of as a household name, right? Major celebrities, major actors, major public elected officials. There's also a second type of public figure known as a limited purpose public figure. And this is somebody who has thrust themselves into the midst of a controversy in an attempt to affect its outcome. If, you, if you're either one of those kind of people, we view under the First Amendment that you get breathing space you are allowed to engage in topics of discussion about these individuals and you can't have a defamation case unless you acted maliciously. And that means that you recklessly disregarded the truth or that you knew it was false. But when it comes to a private person, the standard of care is mere negligence, which means that a person has to act as a reasonably ordinary prudent person would. And if you don't act with the reasonable care, sort of a C student average, if you fall below that, then you can be liable for the things that you say that are false. Because we recognize in this country, there is no content or value to false speech. False speech only harms the marketplace of ideas. So if you did that recklessly, you have to pay for what you did. And so what is the, if, if Elon Musk had just like retweeted it once, let's say, and it was like, ah, oh, that was really impetuous of me and I never corrected it. Would that have crossed the threshold of reckless? Uh, there's actually, there's some discussion about whether simply a retweet could ever be the basis of liability. I think there are some people who have attempted to argue that in court. I never would, right? I don't believe that a retweet is, is enough to establish defamation. 
Likewise, some of, of Elon's early statements about this were not defamatory. For instance, when he replies to a tweet with somebody who's spreading this rumor and he says, you know, in typical Elon style, ooh, very concerning, right? That's not defamation either. What is required is some sort of statement that you're expressing a belief of something true and false. And in this case, it was clear to anybody who was reading it, it was because Elon had seen something elsewhere. He said the kid wants to work for the government. Obviously, he saw that somewhere. That wasn't contained in what he was responding to. So when you make an actual assertion yourself and you seem to have information that supports it and people read it that way, that's what makes it defamatory. It's not necessarily defamatory just to spread lies. It is defamatory, however, to make a, a, a careless or reckless false statement. To, to contribute to it. And does the... And, and where does, like, for instance, if, um, I, I don't know, uh, if, uh, you know, my, uh, let's just say some random person said that uh, on, how is it different that Elon Musk, who has, what is it, 16 million followers? I don't know. On you, like, how does that play into this suit? Is that a function of, like, uh, of proving the uh the damages is that basically where it comes to like how much harm it does to you that's part of it right is is somebody with a reach like musk is going to be able to do way more damage than somebody with 10 followers right that, that's clearly a part of it but it also goes to what he should have been doing reasonably under that situation for instance if you're the new york times and you're investigating a story you have resources at your disposal where you are in your circumstances kind of defines what's reasonable for you if you were just some private person, right, who had no ability to, to, to have any power or investigate anything, your standard might be lower in your circumstances for what you're saying. But Elon Musk is somebody who has every ability to be able to confirm whether this is true or false before he says it. And he also knows that if he does open his mouth, if he does say something to the world, it's going to be heard by almost the entire world. That has to weigh into your analysis about what you're saying to people. You'll know, for instance, that ever since the SEC settlement where, where Musk tricked a bunch of investors of his tweets. Part of that settlement requires that there is an internal securities lawyer who reviews everything that Musk tweets about Tesla, right? Tesla has that protection now that he doesn't end up messing something up with them. And it's not unreasonable to think that if Elon Musk is going to be making accusations against people on the internet, he has the ability to check that out or have somebody check it for him. There's no excuse for him to be making these kind of reckless accusations considering who he is. And he also, it seems to me, I don't know if there's a single human being on the planet who understands the ability of Twitter to destroy someone's life more than Elon Musk. He paid $46 billion for that, that machine, essentially. So he knows the power of Twitter probably more. Like You could prove that he knows the power of Twitter more than any other human being alive, it seems to me. Absolutely. And, and, you know, one of the things that the lawsuit goes into great detail discussing is the fact that for, you know, ever since he bought the platform and even before that, he has fostered this sense of disinformation on the platform. He has made it a haven for abuse. He has made it a, an incubating chamber for neo-Nazi extremism. And all of these things happened on a platform that he created. And he knew that that was monetizable. He understands that conspiracy type, this fodder that they, they, they throw around online. This produces views this this gets attention and and he knows that you know he re, there was a report from the the cdhc where he had restored basically 20 accounts that had been banned and between those 20 accounts were poised to make twitter 20 million dollars next year and and this this sort of stuff is is a, a place that he has incubated and made and so it it, it actually accelerates the damages if he's going to you know defame somebody on that platform he's fully aware of what's going to happen I mean, none of what happened to Ben in this case would be any surprise to anybody. And in fact, it's a function of what he is creating at that platform. Does he have li extra liability than say like someone with, I don't know. I mean, let's say theoretically someone had the same followers that he does, but he's also, it's not just his follower reach. Like you say, he's constructing this machine to, um, to amplify, not only based upon his ability to amplify, but he's constructed the machine to amplify these type of charges. Does he, is he responsible for that as well? Like the, the actions he takes even beyond 
his um, his writing it? I certainly think all of those things are going to be relevant to his level of fault, whether he acted maliciously. And you have to remember, in this kind of suit, normally if I sued somebody who was saying something on Twitter, I might have to go through some very difficult third-party discovery to get anything from Twitter. But in this case, everything in Twitter's files is owned by Elon Musk, and he will be obligated to produce anything relevant in discovery. I think once we get into this case, we may soon discover that the rabbit hole goes very deep in terms of some of these issues. So wait, uh, 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 on that point, do you anticipate the potential to find that either algorithmically or maybe even like just sort of structurally when he tweets something that they are amplified even more if they contain certain uh, elements or if he does it. And that would certainly add to, I mean, that's like, we're, you know what, not only are we going to broadcast this on our news, but we're going to put it, we're going to headline it and we're going to do it on every episode. And, uh, we're going to put it in the right-hand corner of the newspaper or something. Right. I mean, I mean, that sort of gets back to the idea that here you have the most followed person on Twitter, and, and he knows that. And, and I think when you get into this suit and you start doing discovery, I, I would imagine, I mean, I don't know, we're going to have to dig down there and find, but I would be surprised if nobody has attempted to warn Elon about this problem, about what's going on with, with his conduct online. I would, I would have to think that that exists. And at the same time, we seemed to have indications when he took over the platform that Twitter was taking steps to expand his reach, to highlight his tweets, to, you know, essentially everybody who had him blocked was unblocked at one point. You know, like this, this was a, a thing to increase his presence and influence on the site, uh, which is something he really didn't need, because that's the real unfortunate truth is that, you know, a guy like Elon Musk, some of his followers really take what he says as gospel. They, they, he has a, a, he might be, in my opinion, the most influential of all influencers. And yeah. so, yeah, that's really going to affect the analysis in this case. If you find through discovery that his, um, his tweets are algorithmically boosted, which they appear to be uh, from my using of the site, not my claim, not yours. Um, if you do find that, does that make your case stronger? Because that is also him operating, um, as a, a, uh, somebody who's amplifying and broadcasting, their speech on that site and as the chief executive officer there making their communications um more amplified and then also uh despite that increased responsibility both like in in his title and then as it as it potentially is structured in the algorithm is also making defamatory statements i i think in any defamation case to the extent that you can have evidence that the defendant intentionally put this into more spaces, got more eyeballs on it, was working to see more people, that's always going to affect your damages. And in this case, I think it's not only what Elon Musk has done himself and through his platform to expand his reach, but you have to remember that in addition to everybody who saw that tweet, who was a logged in Twitter user, who saw that specific tweet, given the uniqueness of his celebrity, it was entirely predictable and foreseeable that countless individuals all across the internet was going to repeat and republish these allegations. And that was something that, that he absolutely could foresee when making these comments. So it's both of those things in tandem have caused us to have a much greater reach than organically the tweet itself would normally have. Right. Um, what, so where, what's happened with Ben Brody now? I mean, mm -hmm. this... Um, um, yeah. It's tough because on some level, I want to tell you that his life is starting to get back to normal, right? But I'm not sure it ever will. Um, the thing about Ben, and, and I'm sure, you know, right now he's very reclusive, does not want any more light on him, as I'm sure you can imagine. Yeah. At some point that light is going to come, though. And, and what I think the world is going to discover is that Ben is one of the sweetest young men I've ever met. He's, he's so sensitive and such a caring person and, and just generally soft. He's, he's a gentle guy. And he was not... He doesn't hang out online. He doesn't know this world. And this all completely turned him and his family's life upside down. I mean, when you got neo-Nazis threatening your life because of something like this, they just didn't even know what to do. And, you know, I was talking to Ben's mom the other night, and, and she was saying something about how, you know, he's starting to try to get back in the swing of things. This is really throwing him off. Right is about to, he's graduating and starting his career, right? But she has this worry that this has changed him forever, that he's not going to be quite the sweet, trusting, 
He's a little more cynical. It, 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 this kind of light and space can really change a person. And, and I don't think Ben's ever going to be the same. Um, and so what I'm committed more than anything is that I am not going to let this young man be known from here on out as being connected with this neo-Nazi incident. That's not what's going to happen. I'm going to make sure that he is known as the young man who stood up to Elon Musk. You know, I, I, I have known personally some uh, people in sort of like a quasi public policy, I guess, who were called out uh, by folks like Tucker Carlson and Bill O'Reilly, like, well, literally uh, those people. And it, it took them and they're adults. I mean, they're people in their uh, 40s and 50s and it took them years to get out from under this. And, you know, everybody moves on. Nobody thinks about it, but it, it stays in their life. And then there's always like a certain percentage of those people who are convinced they're on some type of like mission because, uh, their, mm -hmm. their guru has, has said this and that it becomes almost like their mission in life, uh, to, in some way to fulfill what their guru had, had, had said for them. Um, Absolutely. it really, I can't even imagine being in that, uh, situation. So what happens next? Like the suit is filed. Mm -hmm. Do, uh, do you start pretrial motions? You start discovery. What just walk us through the, the timeline here. Texas has an anti-slap statute, which is anti-strategic lawsuit against public participation. Anytime you bring a suit that invokes the first amendment, the defendant has a right to seek an early dismissal of that suit. If the defendant believes the suit is frivolous. And if that motion is granted, um, the defendant can actually collect his attorney's fees against the person who brought the suit. That's exactly what Elon Musk's lawyers have said is going to happen. Uh, they would not, Elon did not want to discuss this, would not apologize, would not retract, won't even delete the tweets, right? And have said, if Ben even dares, if he files this lawsuit, we're going to seek to shift fees against him and come after this young man. That's, that's what they say is going to happen. That's the exact same threat Alex Jones made against the Sandy Hook parents. And I wasn't scared of it then, and I'm not scared of it now. But what's going to happen is about 60 days from when the, the suit is served, I'm expecting to see some sort of motion to dismiss. Uh, we'll have to have a hearing on that, maybe some early discovery. Uh, that'll have to get ruled on. And then, unfortunately, I think what's going to happen is Elon would probably appeal that. And just like in the Jones case, we would probably have a year to a year and a half where it would be up on appeal before it came back down for, for pretrial. Um, so the next little bit, it's going to be a, a busy next couple of months. And we're going to have a major fight in the courthouse. Um, and then who knows where it's going to go from there. Either it could go to for appeal or maybe he just goes on to trial. We don't know. Um, but this this next little bit is going to be busy. That's for sure. Well, uh, it's a fascinating case. And uh, my my heart goes out to that kid. I, I can't even imagine uh, being in that situation. And I've been in situations that are not great. But um, to be yeah. completely blindsided by something like that um, is... And, insane and particularly i, I can't even imagine honestly yeah um well uh no, Mark and i thought i thought that when this was brought to the attention of elon's people i thought i honestly did that that elon would quickly apologize retract the statements and make amends and, and make this right and that hasn't happened and i don't know if that's there's one of two things either elon's being callous and isn't going to apologize to this kid and is going to come after him for money or two elon has not been adequately informed about what's going on and my hope is that once he is, once after this news breaks today, that he is going to do the right thing. He is going to apologize. He is going to retract and he is going to make this right. Um, but if he doesn't, we're ready to go all the way. That's for sure. And frankly, he should also, uh, what would be uh, interesting is if he actually took a little more time uh, in assessing his sources. But um, frankly, I'm skeptical that that is a, not a feature as opposed to a bug. Uh, in uh, in what he's doing, but um, well, we'll uh, see. I mean, either this is going to be a learning moment, or it's going to be a very big fight. Mark Bankston, uh, litigator at Farrar and Ball, um, thank you so much for coming on. And uh, we may have some other cases to talk about uh, uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we'll see you at that Mass Torts conference. Uh, Absolutely, we'll, we'll find got a few meeting. interesting things in the pipeline, so we'll All be right. talking soon. <laughs> Great. All right. Thank uh, you. Thank you so much. Thank really you. appreciate it. Um, folks, we're going to head into the, uh, fun half of the program, wherein we will take your phone calls and your IMs. This is a big deal. I mean, I think, uh, my personal opinion is that Musk is going to refuse to admit that he was wrong.
and just sort of play yes. it out and try and uh, run out the clock. I think he's going to be very gracious and uh, apologetic. Well, <laughs> this is this is we have all sorts of opinions on the program. Yeah, so, uh, it, <laughs> ideological I'm diversity. Very, I'm very sorry. I am very sorry. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You would you would never hear him say that. But like that's what <clears throat> rich people who have lawyers and can pay them to just work uh, and, and and almost work in the background for them. They don't feel it at all. That's the kind of arrogance that they to engage have, in. They yeah. just think that they can run out the clock because people don't have the money. To have the money to be like, to create problems and be like, I'll just let my lawyer handle that. I'm going to go do it. Well, the other thing too, gun. that yeah. I think is really important from a political standpoint to understand is that um, Elon Musk definitely feels that part of his uh, mission in life is to run interference for neo-Nazis. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's, that, that, that's why there's like these, the, I mean, if folks step back and just think for a moment and think you brought up Ray Epps, but also think about the Alex Jones stuff, crisis actors, right? Pro provocateurs, government provocateurs, all of these sort of constructs are designed to argue that in fact, None of this is a problem. And by none of this meaning whether it's mass shootings or the proliferation of Nazis or the idea that there are people who want to come in and hang Mike Pence mm -hmm. and burn down the Capitol. These aren't real issues. You are being made to believe that these are issues by people, by the real bad guys who are the liberals or the um you know anti uh arm yourself folks or the globe or emojis. the feds or the globe emoji jews who are you know trying to infiltrate the neo-nazis you know th there are no neo-nazis there's just you know government people and jews dressing up as nazis so that they can um you know oppress i guess regular people or um you know or stifle, stifle speech it's, yeah it's, this is yeah. but this is the important thing to understand this is the game plan yep. that has existed for decades, centuries, uh, in terms of misinformation. I mean, like, you know, um, this is what they do. Mm -hmm. They make it seem like none of this is real. It is all being, uh, you know, somebody's pulling the strings right. and uh, creating these fake, these fake um, events as a way of justifying government oppression or, you know, Jewish control or, you know, anti-gun, uh, you know, uh, or masks or vaccines. Yes. Yeah. You don't take the Nazis seriously, but uh, anytime there's something going on in South Africa, you very much take the specter of white genocide uh, extremely seriously. And you use your platform to say they're openly pushing for genocide of white people in South Africa. That's because, you know, it, it says a lot what you'll be hysterical about and what you'll say is uh, not a problem. It is, uh, I would say, a concerning trend that one of the biggest communications platforms in the world uh, has been bought by somebody who feels that it is his duty to undercut methods of like honest communication about facts uh, and then uses his platform probably to algorithmically boost his disinformation efforts. That's not a great d thing that's happened. Apartheid nostalgic in my opinion. Um, and we should say, I mean, this is the the value of these type of lawsuits. I mean, it, I, I don't know that um, uh, th this plaintiff is going to financially cripple Elon Musk. That's not going to happen. The guy has, um, you know, just an, a countless amounts of money. Um, although, you know, the Sandy Hook people, well, I think, uh, definitely financially crippled uh, Alex Jones. Um, that's going to be ongoing. But... What it also does is just the idea of the trial and putting yourself through that. I mean, kudos to that kid. It's not going to be a fun couple of years for him in dealing with this. Um, a kid. I mean, he's 22, 23, but I mean, as far as I'm concerned, kid. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, is, it offers the opportunity to examine these issues in a very sort of like clinical way. So that people can see like, hey, wait a second, there's a pattern here, a pattern here that someone feels like they could go to court 
It is so established they could go to court and establish this pattern of behavior it's not something I'm imagining. I mean, that's what the value of these type of cases are in many respects as well. It is clarifying for the public about a dynamic that is larger than just this one instance with this one guy. Um, because the right, right-wing right influencers, whether it is Elon Musk or someone like Alex Jones, they're always trying to straddle the line of social acceptability to launder as much as they can of neo-Nazi propaganda, of anti-government, of racist whatever, into the public with plausible deniability. So, like, the more the, these this becomes clear to people, the, val the less they're able to engage in that without uh, triggering some alarm bells for some. And people should also understand, like, why why is this done? I mean, this is the thing that I think it's sometimes people don't fully get and why it's so easily dismissed. The idea is that the wider you disseminate this uh, information, you don't need a majority of people to buy into it. There have been no, like, social movements where they have uh, succeeded or have the most, um, the, been most active where it represents the majority of the people. The vast, like I, I'm almost definitely like movements succeed with a relatively small amount of people who engage in these things. But it also has to do with like the depth of their commitment. And the wider these things get disseminated, the um, wider to the margins things become reasonable. And then the idea for certain people is like, if I'm just outside of what is reasonable, I'm still pretty justified. Mm -hmm. But because those margins have widened, it's really extreme. So in other words, like if uh, you, you're putting out these sort of white supremacy ideas, and they get disseminated. And at the same time, you are able to not activate the, the blowback from it, right? Like if Ray Epps was actually the, a fed, if some of these people were actual feds and they were, these were all psyops, normal people would be like, we can't, you know, this is not a real thing that we're acting upon. But at the same time, the, the ideas still get disseminated. You've frozen the opposition and the response time to these things coming out. The fire is still spreading, but the fire department has been told false alarm. Don't come out of the, um, uh, the firehouse. The fire continues to spread. And that's what the theory is here. That's why they're doing this. To allow the fire or the embers to burn and keep the fire department in the building. And the fire department in this instance is like normal people mm -hmm. rejecting this stuff and reacting and saying like, hey, wait a second. There needs to be standards for this. And then to further the metaphor, it's like a financial incentive too. They, you know, Elon Musk has some insurance claim on the house that's burning down and that's why he needs it to keep going, for example, right? Like that's- it's the, ideological. I, it's both. Can be both, right? I guess it can be both as well. Yes. On the right, it's both. Yes. For not for him, it's nice. It's a twofer. Yeah. Um, folks, it's your support that makes this show possible. You can become a member. Join the majority report dot com. When you do, you not only support, uh, you not only get the free show free of commercials. You support the fun half, and you get the fun half, and you get to I am the show uh, via the app if you want. Unlocks that special level up. Uh, I am the show. Also, uh, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. But today, really, honestly, you should go and check out. Uh, you get 30% off at uh, sunsetlakecebaday.com. 30% off their Sebaday uh, coffee. If you've never had Sebaday infused coffee, now is the time to try this. 30% off. You got to do it today, though. You do it right now. Sunset Lake dot com uh so sunset like lake seven seven day day dot com. com yeah we'll put the link in the uh, youtube and podcast description uh emma 
ESVN, yes. Today we're going to go a little early because I'm going to the Giants game and I have to get home and get ready for that. Mm. Yeah, so um, if for some reason... You know what? I was in Baltimore uh, for that VidCon uh, thing over the weekend and uh, just an aside, like, <laughs> it is... It, no, it's, Urban planning aside? Or No, it's about urban planning. Yep. Camden Yards, right next to M&T Bank Stadium, yep. right near where I was staying in my hotel. You could go see the Orioles and then go see the Ravens game, and then you could walk into the Inner Harbor. I've got to take like three effing trains to get to MetLife Stadium. I was there last night, and I, I left at around 11, and I got home at 1 a.m. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, whatever. So anyway. Baltimore's but, a great city. I really, really enjoy Baltimore, and, and that was part of why I wanted to go. Um, so it was great to be there. But uh, you, we'll be talking about all of uh, the weekend of football, youtube.com slash ESPN show. Uh, we'll go a little early today, probably like 3.30. So. We get to talk a little bit about uh, your uh, your trip uh, down to that uh, VidCon. Yeah. I'm I didn't see the whole thing, but I did see a, a clip of a video where I want to uh, defend you in uh, in forgetting uh, Destiny's name. I mean, first off, it's just it's it's just weird to be talking to somebody whose name is Destiny. It's well, like, <laughs> but, to be honest, but, but I, 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 I was, it took me a long time, and there's been many times, honestly, where I have forgotten his first name because people just refer to him as. Uh, I, I didn't. I thought I did. I thought he had blue hair. He does have blue hair. Right, well, not when I saw, and I don't think I'd ever heard him speak. So I was just a little. I was confused, so I'm sorry if yeah, I saw that too. But you People know, some, were very, Zeke, very mad about it. Zika uh, uh, clipped you all shaking hands at the I end saw, of the interview. Yeah, That's what I, I think I, I saw it. that. I saw that, but uh, yeah, I, it was it was funny. I I just I was I guess supposed to wrap it up, and I didn't know how to do it. But oh well. Left reckoning guy. So I can't remember your name. Year. Yeah. Left yeah. reckoning guy. Whatever it's. Whatever my name is. Whatever uh, your name is. <laughs> last night, or, or not last night, on Sunday, uh, patreon.com slash left reckoning, we talked with the Vanguard boys, Gavin and Zach, about uh, different primary stuff, Green Party strategy, what we look for in candidates and message candidates versus real candidates and that sort of stuff. Um, patreon.com slash left reckoning to get access to that. All right, folks. See you in the fun half. You right. are in for it. All right, folks. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the fun. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. Who sent us this? Alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy is back, and the alpha males are back. Back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy, back. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are 